Around midnight on August 21st, 1955, a group of eight adults and three children would enter the Hopkinsville, Kentucky police station terrified. The women and children were hysterical and the group claimed that for the past three hours they had been under attack by small alien-like creatures and had gone through four boxes worth of ammunition to keep them at bay. Local law enforcement, frightened of the story and unaware of the situation taking place, worried of a possible gunfight between locals and called in assistance to go check the property. In total, four city police officers, five state troopers, three deputy sheriffs, and four military police officers from the nearby Fort Campbell were called in to assist. When law enforcement arrived at the farm, there wasn't much evidence to be found. Upon searching the house and surrounding area for any clues as to what was going on, investigators would find just two things. There was evidence of gunfire coming from in and around the house and a strange glowing patch of grass where one of the creatures was supposedly shot. What would follow is the birth of one of Kentucky's most notorious cryptids and one of the most documented and controversial cases of an alien encounter that we've ever seen. So what had occurred in the last three hours to turn this seemingly normal house into a battleground with the supernatural? And what was it that they had really seen? Our story begins with a man named Elmer Sutton. Elmer was born in 1930 as the third child to Glennie Lankford. He worked in a traveling carnival where he picked up his notorious nickname, Lucky, after having the word tattooed on the fingers of his left hand. In that carnival was another man by the name of Billy Ray Taylor. Him and his wife had been staying with the Sutton family at their farmhouse for the past few months, and around 7 p.m. the night of August 21st, Billy Ray would go to get water from the well. As he was bringing the bucket up, he said he looked up in the sky and saw a bright silvery object flying towards him. He claimed it flew over him, passed over the house, then stopped in the air for a moment before it dropped down past a nearby tree line out of sight. After seeing this, Billy Ray ran inside to tell the Suttons and his wife of what he just witnessed. They laughed at him and told him he must have just seen a shooting star. Billy Ray was already supposedly known for being a jokester and wasn't to be taken very seriously, so the family just thought he had come up with an odd story for a joke. That didn't last long though, as not even an hour later, the dog behind the house started barking to the point Lucky and Billy Ray went to go check to see what was going on. When they looked out back to investigate, what they saw was a glowing aura of light around 20 yards away, slowly approaching the house. As they got closer, they began to be able to see what the source of it was. A small humanoid creature, about three and a half foot tall, seemed to be emitting the light. Lucky quickly grabbed his shotgun and gave a 22 rifle to Billy Ray, a response making me proud to be an American. The creature was described as having a gray metallic colored skin. It also had large round eyes that glowed yellow in the darkness, and long pointy ears that poked out above its head. The creature had its hands raised, as if it understood it was being held at gunpoint and trying to surrender. When it kept approaching the house though, Lucky quickly took aim and shot at it. They heard a metallic sound, and it flipped to the ground, but before they could register that they hit it, it jumped back up and ran around the corner of the house. They waited a few moments to see if it would show back up before going in the living room where their wives were. When they entered the room, another creature appeared outside the window right next to them. J.C. Sutton, Lucky's brother, had gotten a shotgun from him at this point and quickly shot at it through the window screen. Billy Ray also fired at the creature with a .22. After getting hit, it flipped down to the ground and then ran away, again seemingly taking no damage from the gunfire. The three men then decided to go outside to see what it was they were shooting at and if they actually hit it. Which, I can't stress this enough, if you don't know what you were even shooting at, you probably didn't need to be shooting at it in the first place. But, moving on. Billy Ray was the first to walk outside, and what the group behind him saw was a claw-like hand reach down from the overhang above the door and grab at his hair. One of the women, Aline Sutton, the wife of Lucky, quickly grabbed Billy Ray back screaming at what they just witnessed. Lucky quickly ran outside to see what tried to grab Billy, and when he turned around, he saw another one of those creatures on top of the roof. He took aim and shot it, knocking it down. Billy Ray then spotted a second one sitting in a nearby tree, and both him and Lucky shot at it, knocking it off a branch. It then apparently floated down to the ground before they shot at it again, only for it to run away like the ones before. 
Then a third creature, or maybe the one that was knocked down off the roof just before, came running around the corner of the house towards Lucky. He quickly turned and shot it point blank with his shotgun, knocking it over onto the ground only for it to get up and run away. Which, if you've ever been around guns at all, then you know shotguns aren't the type of gun to hit you point blank and do nothing. Lucky knew this and decided to retreat back into the house for now. After this, it's just a couple of things that they reported happen instead of an actual timeline of events. Like for instance, at one point in the night, one of the three kids was outside when a creature appeared and got shot at, which I don't know why in the world, if you were in a situation where you apparently had gone through four boxes worth of ammunition to keep away unknown creatures that, let me remind you, didn't get hurt by a point blank shotgun blast, would you ever let one of your kids around these things? Parents of the year, ladies and gentlemen. While they were inside the house, the family reported hearing scratching on the roof, and when they went outside to see what was causing it, they saw another one of the creatures up there. After shooting at it, it apparently floated to a fence about 40 feet away and seemed to perch on it, only for them to shoot at it again, causing it to get knocked down and run away. What's interesting is that when the creatures were run away, they would drop down on all fours instead of walking on two legs like they initially started out on. They were also so fast, the family couldn't tell if it was a big group of the creatures or just two or three constantly reappearing. Finally, it was around 11 p.m. when the Suttons decided to leave and go to Hopkinsville to get help. And a side note that I want to point out is that when they were leaving, one of the kids needed to be packed to the car because they were too scared to even leave the house. And if you ask me, I have no idea which kid that could have been. When they arrived at the police station, the officers were taken aback by the story. According to the police, it was scary how much fear the group showed and the sense of urgency by them to get help. The police chief, Russell Greenwell, even remarked later that these aren't the kind of people who normally run to the police for help. When they feel themselves threatened, what they do is reach for their guns, which, for the 50s in America, isn't uncommon. That's why it was so jarring to see the Suttons making these claims at near midnight. When law enforcement arrived at the farm, there wasn't much evidence to be found. Investigators noted that there were shotgun shells around the front of the house and there was a window frame that had holes in it that was said to have been shot through, but investigators would only go on to collect five shells from around the property, unfortunately making no effort to collect any more or document how many were actually present. Which I can't stress this enough, why? Why would the police not worry about something as important as, you know, how many shots were actually fired at a crime scene? What can you do? Good job, guys. When they moved their investigation outside, this is when they found the glowing patch of grass. The patch was said to be about a foot and a half in diameter, and according to Greenwell, it stood out like black on white to the grass around it. Also, it was only visible if you looked at it from a certain angle, so if you walked around it in a circle, you would only see the glow from one side. Other than this, though, it was noted as being no different than the grass around it, and it was also noted that this is reportedly where one of the creatures was shot. So now we know alien blood makes grass glow. The funniest part of the story for me, though, is that sometime during the investigations, everyone was so on edge from the sentence claims that the thought of these otherworldly creatures looming in the darkness around the farm was so overwhelming that when someone accidentally stepped on a cat's tail, it caused it to scream and all the officers around unholstered their weapons in a panic thinking it was one of the alien creatures attacking them and it was apparently so fast and big of a reaction that Greenwell even said that the speed of everyone to the cat was impressive which is just a great visual to think that this cat had all these men thinking they were getting attacked by an alien I like to imagine it was a lot like this But after searching for two hours and finding no proof of any aliens, they left. It was around 2 a.m. at this point and they promised the Suttons that they'd return after daylight to continue their investigation. This didn't mean the night was over just yet for the Suttons though, as Miss Lankford claimed that 
After the police left, they tried to lay down and get some sleep only for the creatures to return. She said there was a glow coming from outside her bedroom window and when she looked closer, she saw a creature staring into the bedroom at her. She said it reached its claw-like hand up on the window screen and what followed went something like this. Miss Langford called her son into the room to look at it and when he saw it, he immediately grabbed his gun saying, Mama, I'm gonna shoot that little man. Now, I don't know if like he actually had that thick of a country accent, but I like to think that he did. The last reported sighting of one of the creatures was at 5.15 on August 22nd. There were 11 people there that night, and I'll go ahead and list them for you now. That way, if I mention any names you don't recognize, you won't be confused. Miss Langford, Lucky, Lucky's wife, Aline, JC, JC's wife, Vera, Billy Ray, and Billy Ray's wife, June Taylor, OP Baker, and the three kids. Lucky, JC, and OP Baker had a long day ahead of them though as they had plans to go to Evansville, Indiana about an hour north of Hopkinsville. So when police arrived, only the women that were present the night before were questioned. The fourth man, Billy Ray Taylor, went out hunting with a neighbor so he also wasn't there. When investigators arrived, some took to the woods around the Sutton farmhouse looking for any proof of a UFO landing in the area. Some started taking statements from the family and one even climbed on the roof to investigate the claims of scratching. The area was apparently experiencing a drought at the time, so investigators thought the roof may have a layer of dust that would show indications of anything being up there. However, there was no proof of anything being up there except the investigator himself. Greenwell would go on to interview the witnesses present and after questioning said the statements from the women and children matched the story from the night before. He also said that he tried his best to try and confuse them and trip them up on small details only for them to correct him. The search around the property showed no signs of any kind of UFO or creatures and there wasn't an update on the weird glowing patch of grass so I assume it was gone by the morning. Inside the house they inspected the window screen only to find that it had more bullet holes in it now than it did the night before, presumably from the encounters after the police left. One officer even dug some BB shot from one of the shotguns out of a window frame showing that at least one shot was taken from inside the house. But after another long and extensive search of the property and the area where the UFO was said to have landed, they left, with nothing but a few empty shells and a few holes in a window screen to support the Sutton's claims. However, the single most important person in terms of documentation and preservation for this case had yet to arrive. An amateur local radio host by the name of Andrew Ledwith was on his way to the Sutton farmhouse. The story had spread like wildfire across the county since early in the morning but he was late to the party and had only just heard about it around noon. After hearing the details, he remembered reading about a new investigation tactic used by police to get a description of suspects called sketching. Sketch artists would take details from the witnesses and construct a drawing from their testimonies. Ledwood had once studied art and thought maybe he could do the same to figure out what the Sutton saw. With this as his plan, he grabbed a notebook and a representative from the WHOP station as a witness, then they set out to the Sutton farmhouse. When they arrived, Miss Lankford was outside the house in a rocking chair, and the men still hadn't returned from Evansville. She, along with Aline and Vera, agreed to an interview with Ledwith, while June Taylor had stayed. Unfortunately, this is where things start to get a little messy. Ledwith was not a trained interrogator or sketch artist. It was 1955, and he was simply here, out of his own curiosity, to record things. So the three women were all interviewed together and weren't separated to get individual accounts and sketches. This is obviously a big deal when it comes to forensics, and it must be said that the sketch and interview can't be taken as uncorrupted truth without even mentioning the whole alien thing. But we'll get into why I'm using Ludwig's accounts in just a minute. During the interview, they would come to describe several key details that I've already mentioned, but I'll go over them again as a reminder. The creature had a round head, was bald, it had pointed ears that reached out above its head, and a small slit-like mouth. The eyes were large, and it didn't seem to have a neck. Its arms reached down its entire body and ended on some talon-like fingers. Everyone agreed that they hadn't seen any feet, and it stood at three and a half foot tall. The one thing that stood out to lead with the most though, and maybe even to you, is no one seemed to think it had a nose. They all said it could have had one, and he tried sketching one in, but the women weren't sure, so they agreed to leave it out. 
After completing the sketch, they showed it to June Taylor, who was in the kitchen, to confirm with her, and she agreed that it was a matching description. It is also noted that Ludwith found a few beer cans in the trash can and his companion found a shotgun shell in the living room during the interview. After all this, Ledwith and his witness decided to go out to where Billy Gray claimed the ship landed and see if they could find any evidence of there actually being one. With no luck and in about an hour of searching around the property for anything, they returned to the house empty-handed. Not long after they got back, Billy Ray returned from his hunting trip, gun in hand. When he came in the house, Ledwith put the woman's sketch onto a bed and walked away from it in a way I can only understand as a way to gauge Billy Ray's reaction to seeing the sketch and what supposedly they had seen the night before. Now, you're not alone if you're sitting here thinking, wow, why would you let another key witness become corrupted by seeing the sketch before making his own? But, to be fair, it's the 1950s, forensics isn't as nearly developed as it is today, and... Ledwith isn't even a trained investigator. He was a reporter, so we just have to deal with it. When Billy Ray entered the room, he ran to the drawing and picked it up and is quoted as saying, That's it, that's it, that looks just like it. Ledwith then led him in another room of the house and started on a sketch of his own, which shockingly would closely match the woman's sketch. Ledwith would then arrange to come back later in the day with the family to interview the three remaining men who were still out of town at this time. At this point in the day, a few sightseers had already begun to arrive at the Sutton Farmhouse. Miss Lankford had agreed to record an interview for the local radio station, WHOP, and the broadcasting from it had attracted people to come and see what exactly was going on in the community. This, however, was only the beginning of the attraction to the Suttons, and they had no idea what was in store for them. Before going any further, I want to tell you why exactly I'm using Ledwith's accounts so heavily. The Ledwith accounts being so accessible and preserved is thanks to the work of Isabel Davis and Ted Blocher in their book Close Encounters at Kelly and others of 1955. All of Ledwith's sketches and interviews he took during this time at the Suttons are shared here. I definitely recommend it as the book takes a more in-depth look at the Hopkinsville Coblin case than this video does and has a lot more information with some similar cases as well. But getting back to what I was trying to say, Andrew Ledwith is the main reason this case stands out among a sea of UFO sightings. He was able to interview the Suttons before the media would get a hold of them. He arrived purely on the intention of documenting this story as it was told, so he wasn't there to get the next big story or make a joke out of it like most of the people later would, and he also wasn't there to take the Suttons' word like they were gospel. He wanted to record the truth. So the fact that he was able to document not only the stories but also how they acted around each other it makes this account invaluable after the fact 90 percent of the accounts on the story would either be blatant lies by people trying to make it more dramatized than it actually was this would cause a lot of frustration with the suttons and they would go on to resent the media and abstain from most publicity so the fact that we have their stories before they got corrupted to time and outside influences Anything he recorded should be the purest and unadulterated versions of what the Suttons claimed happened. However, this does not mean that it was 100% uncorrupted, as we know with how he treated the sketches and interviews. Yet, this remains to be the most complete documentation of the events that happened and the aftermath that followed. The newspapers are where most of the confusion on the matters involving the case comes from, and this is where people get the estimations of there being 12 to 15 creatures, that they were green, and a lot of other details that just don't match with Ludwig's accounts or other newspaper accounts at the time. So to truly learn what may have happened and who exactly the Suttons are, it's best to use Ledwith. When Ledwith returned around 7.30 p.m. to interview the men, they still had not returned from Evansville. He took this opportunity to make another sketch uh, with Billy Ray of the ship that he claimed to have seen, and during this, Billy Ray began to make corrections on the sketch of the creature they did earlier. According to Ledwith, Billy Ray experimented with earphones and antennas protruding from the head and started to say the creature had a muscular body. Notably, he insisted that he had seen a nose on the creature, even after what the women claimed earlier of not seeing one. Ledwith followed his direction and sketched what he described, but soon realized that Billy Ray seemed to be elaborating on the details and taking advantage of the attention he was getting. Not long after, a soldier from Fort Campbell, who was not part of the investigation the night before, also came to make sketches of the creatures. He was a lot like Ledwith and was there purely out of curiosity. So, seeing an easy opportunity to get away from Billy Ray, 
Ledwith handed him off to the soldiers so they could start their own sketch. And as a side note, Ledwith would later comment that the soldier was falling hook, line, and sinker for Billy Ray's extravagant details that no other witness would point out. By the time the three men arrived around 8.30 p.m., Lucky, J.C., and O.P. Baker had returned to cars lined half a mile down the road in each direction from the Sutton farmhouse. Lucky, who in every account is described as a very intimidating type of man, was not happy with his homecoming, and you can't really blame him. The group had to have been awake well past 24 hours at this point, so when he saw this, he was described as marching in the house like a bear ready to run people out of his home. He kept this energy until out of the corner of his eye, he saw the sketch that the women had done this morning. When he saw it, he immediately grabbed it and began pointing out corrections on it. For example, he said that the head wasn't round enough. Ludwith then immediately got to work on a sketch with the three men. Again, I have to mention, the three men all witnessed a woman's sketch before making their own. But in spite of this and this interview, we get a lot of valuable information, not only on the story and the creatures, but the Suttons themselves. Much of the details were the same, there was no neck, it was bald, however, Lucky was adamant that there was no mouth. JC and OP claimed they had seen one, although it wasn't much of one, just a small slit, matching the woman's description. With not much else changing, except the shape of the head and the size of the ears, Ledwith still had one question. What about the nose? No one had mentioned it, so, finally, he asked. None of the three men had seen a nose. Ledwith even noted that Lucky was adamant there was no nose. However, Billy Ray, who was still being interviewed by the soldier, spoke up from across the room and said he had definitely seen a nose. This is where things get interesting. Ledwith records that Lucky gave him a disdainful look after he said this. Then, Billy Ray began to backtrack and say, well, he wasn't exactly sure if he'd seen a nose. The soldier, who seemed to pick up on this, started to go over their sketch again, confirming every detail with Billy. However, this would backfire in a way that I have to talk about. He began unintentionally inserting ideas into Billy Ray's head on certain details. Ludwig said that at one point he heard the soldier ask which way the arms moved and whether they could move forward and backwards, which Billy Ray seemed to eat right up and run with. If you don't really understand, when you're interviewing for like a sketch, you don't really want to proposed ideas in their head. So when he's asking uh, which way the arms moved and whether they can move forward and backwards, in Billy's mind he's like, well, yeah, maybe they did move forward and backwards. Or with Billy Ray in general, he might have just been like, hey, that's a good idea, let's go with that. However, despite all this, Ledwood had only good comments on the group, claiming that during the interviews, the witnesses were not bouncing off each other in a way to come to an agreement, and they all seemed to be 100% sure with what happened and didn't contradict each other. Now, when it comes to the sketches, you can't really expect them to be very different because they all had access to the previous sketches before they made their own, so... In the next few days, the media went crazy about the incident. Thousands of sightseers, reporters, and even businessmen showed up to the Sutton farmhouse trying to learn the story. This is where a lot of the misconceptions and over-dramatized versions of the story start. Newspapers would claim that there were 11 to 15 creatures, and this is where the little green men concept came from, except they were gray in every report, and only two to three could ever be identified separately. Also, in some articles, it says that there were 12 people there that night, but according to Ledwith, there were only 11. On the 23rd, the Sutton farmhouse was stormed. People would look into their windows and walk into their house with nothing to stop them, even going so far as demand the group pose for pictures. It was reported that at least 2,000 people had been around the Sutton house on the 23rd. With so many people flocking to the property, local businessmen even asked to set up concessions and start selling souvenirs. The Suttons turned them down, however. Except, it seems they took this idea as they started posting signs charging visitors who wanted to come on the property. 50 cents for admission, $1 for information, and a whole $10 to take pictures. In today's money, that's $6 for admission, $11 for information, and $115 for pictures. This move backfired on them though and lost them a lot of sympathy and caused skeptics and critics of the family to have an easy time as it seemed the Suttons finally showed their true colors and they were making it up for publicity and profit. However, I don't think this is the case. In the local afternoon paper, Miss Langford put out an appeal begging for people to leave them alone. They were being hounded by visitors and couldn't find any peace anywhere near their home. 
Miss Lankford had already called the state troopers multiple times that day to have people removed from their property, only for them to return after the police left. I can understand the thought process of trying to deter people with an entrance fee. At one point, they even left with a plan of going to Michigan, where one of Miss Lankford's daughters lived, but decided to turn around and go back because they were so scared that people would steal their belongings as souvenirs. Also, no money was ever reported collected except for just one instance. Can you guess out of anyone from the Sutton family who it could have been? The results may shock you. Yeah, it was it was Billy Ray. Of course it was Billy Ray. He was reported as being paid by two reporters for a story, so I'm not sure how much he got or if it was even true, but I'm going to go ahead and assume it was because it's Billy Ray. Interestingly, the Air Force issued two statements during this time, claiming that there had been no official investigation on the incident and that there were no basis to the reports of UFOs or its passengers. There may not have been an official investigation, but it seems that it was looked into at least a little bit, as there are Project Blue Book documents on the case, and there were people in the Air Force reported as being on site. The day after the sighting, Evansville Press reported that Fort Campbell sent Major Albert Corrin to investigate the reports. However, the Public Information Office at Fort Campbell reported that they had no knowledge of the incident. We know this isn't the case, though, as people from Fort Campbell did go to investigate the case the night it actually occurred. Plus, the soldier that interviewed Billy Ray was literally from Fort Campbell. Even if he was there on his own accord, that means there was knowledge there about the incident. Also, Greenwell stated that Air Force intelligence from Fort Campbell was definitely on the scene, and Greenwell also had another strange report about two men who came from Standiford Field in Louisville, now known as Louisville International Airport. Also, if you think it's pronounced Louisville, you're wrong, and you can't argue with me because this is pre-recorded. These two men contacted him before going out to the Sutton Farm, but didn't share much information about who they were or what they wanted, and didn't share what they actually did on the farm. Greenwell did think that they were civil defense officials though, so who knows exactly what these two were up to or who they actually were. Not only that, but remember when I told you Billy Ray went on a hunting trip with a neighbor on the 22nd? Ledwith would later interview this neighbor, and during this trip he claimed both him and Billy Ray saw two army airplanes circling over the area for some time, claiming one was a light observation plane and the other was a large aircraft. So there most definitely was some sort of activity by the Air Force on the scene. There's no record of who this neighbor is or their background, but them not linking a name isn't too suspicious. After all, seeing what happened with the Suttons, many neighbors feared having the same happen to them, so they would either abstain from interviews or do them anonymously. So I'm more inclined to believe this account as it's not coming from Billy Ray, and in case you haven't noticed, I really don't trust Billy Ray. I mean, you can ask why I would trust any of them. They claim they were in a gunfight with aliens, and that is a fair point. But what I would say to you is boo-hoo. You must be really fun at the cryptid parties. As the event got further and further away from the Suttons, they would become very apprehensive with the story, which I can't really blame them for. Whether they saw aliens or not, what they went through was nothing short of constant harassment and mental torture. Skeptics would hound the family calling them liars and saying they only made it up while reporters were constantly on their doorstep giving them no privacy. This would eventually drive them to sell the property and move within the year. But here's what we're really here for. What happened to the Sutton family? Now, there have been a bunch of different theories over the years that have been brought up, but some are more believable than others. So, I think I'll start with the ones that are less likely and less believable and then move to the ones that are more believable or more in the realm of possibility. One of the popular theories at the time was that the family was severely intoxicated. This could explain some of the events, but definitely not all of them. Ledwith did find some beer cans in the trash can the day after, but there was nowhere near enough for eight people to be so intoxicated that they would hallucinate an alien invasion. And according to officers that were there that night, and almost all of the reports that followed, the Sutton showed no evidence that they were under the influence of alcohol. It's hard to believe that eight people were so intoxicated that they dreamed up a shared hallucination of an alien invasion and somehow didn't show a single hint of being under the influence to investigators. So I think it's unlikely that alcohol was the sole reason behind this. Some speculated it was a case of mass hysteria. I mean, there are cases of mass hysteria, such as the Dancing Plague of 1518, where a woman began dancing in the streets of Strasbourg, France. I'm sure I mispronounced that horribly, but the woman apparently danced for a week straight. 
during this time, others would seemingly fall under the same affliction and join her dancing for different lengths of time. Before it was over, it reportedly affected up to 400 victims, and depending on the source, led to the deaths of some affected. However, it's still debated whether people actually died to it, and there is no explanation of what actually happened to cause all this. It's an unexplainable case. Mass hysteria could very well be what happened, but we don't really understand much about it, and it's not as fun as a theory, so moving on. Next is my personal favorite theory, not because it's true or anything, but it's just the best. Someone put forth the notion that maybe the creatures weren't from outer space, but instead were monkeys used in rocket launch experiments that had crashed nearby. You heard that right. You can't tell me the thought of four rednecks getting into a firefight with monkey astronauts like you're playing COD zombies on Ascension isn't the best thing ever. However, there were no recorded uses of monkeys in the area. Plus, the Suttons claim that they hit the creatures multiple times with gunfire. There most definitely would be evidence if they got shot. And with almost every conspiracy theory, there's a link to Hollow Earth. Some conspiracy theorists suggested that the creatures came from the underground caves of Kentucky, linking all the way to Mammoth Cave. There's also claims of an entire underground race of these goblins, and who knows, they might be right. Although I've been to Mammoth Cave multiple times, and I've never got to see this entrance to Hollow Earth or any goblins, so who knows, maybe I'm just not cool enough to hang out with them. The most plausible theory by skeptics was put forward by a man named Joe Nickel. He suggested that the family could have misidentified the creatures with eagle owls. Eagle owls, or great horned owls, are native to the area. They are nocturnal, they fly silently, have yellow eyes, and are aggressive when in defense of their nests, which does fit the description pretty accurately, however not 100%. If they really were great horned owls, then there would have been traces left of them when they got shot. Lucky did claim he hit the creatures multiple times, with one shot even being point blank from a shotgun, so if they were owls, then they most definitely would have left blood, feathers, or any kind of evidence if hit by gunfire. But let's have fun with it and say they missed all those shots. Then why didn't anyone see the owls after the fact? If they were supposedly defending their nest, then they should have defended it again when investigators arrived. I mean, 10 to 15 people is a lot more to defend against than 3 to 4 people, so Maybe they could have resorted to hiding at that point, and I have nothing to refute that, but it's hard to believe that these owls evaded detection by investigators when they were supposedly in the area defending their nest. And yes, I know it's ironic I'm talking about an alien invasion, and somehow that's hard to believe, but multiple times throughout the night, they claimed to hit the creatures. Billy Ray, who apparently was a hunter as he went the day after, also fired at the creatures, so it's hard to think that they missed all their shots when they claimed to have gone through four boxes worth of ammunition. Nickel also points out that Billy Ray may have seen a meteor shower that night and mistook it for what he thought was a UFO. Then we have the theory that it's all a hoax. This is the one I have the most to talk about, so let's get started. First, let's go over the issue with the bullets. There were four guns present in the house that night. 120 gauge shotgun, 112 gauge shotgun, 122 rifle, and a miniature German pistol that was a souvenir of JC's that supposedly wasn't used. They collected five shells that night and they tested them to see if any of them had actually been shot. It showed that four out of five of them had been shot. With that in mind, Ledwith interviewed a neighbor sometime after who reported hearing four shots that night, but had thought they were firecrackers so they didn't think much about them. This would precisely match the police's report out of the four or five shells that they collected were shot. But before you jump up saying that's it, it must be a hoax, let me remind you, the police made no effort to collect any more shells than these five. And we do know that there were more than these five on the scene as Ledwith's companion did find one during the interviews the day after. So how many bullets were really shot that night? If Ledwith was willing to note one shell being found, then he most certainly would have noted there being more. And there definitely would have been more if they went through four boxes worth of ammunition that JC claimed they did. Were they already cleaned up by the time Ledwith arrived? I mean, that is a possibility as Ledwith did not arrive until noon, so who knows? And to explain why the neighbor only heard four shots, the encounters were separated by a sizable time. The Suttons said that whenever the creatures would run away, they didn't know if they'd be gone for good or not, as it wasn't uncommon for them to be gone long enough for the Suttons to question if they were coming back. So maybe the neighbor had fallen asleep at that point, or maybe he had left the area. 
It is still hard to believe that neighbors wouldn't hear four boxes worth of ammunition, though. And I think it's most likely an exaggeration, so let's take a closer look. There was evidence of the sudden shooting, though. We can't deny that. The four bullets collected by police prove that much. So did they shoot their own house up to try and make it more believable? The window screen that was shot out was collected by Ledwith in August of 56, which he then sent to New York for testing. The screen showed holes matching that of 22 and two bigger holes, both apparently showing in all appearances to be made by either the 12 gauge shotgun or 20 gauge shotgun. The wire was bent outwards and the roughness of the wire couldn't be repeated by pushing a pencil through by investigators so it had to have been something with enough force to tear the wire and not stretch it. A gunshot would explain this. JC Sutton claimed that they went through four boxes worth of ammunition during the night. That's a lot of ammo, but how much exactly? The standard amount of shells you have in a box of 12 gauge and 20 gauge is 25, and this means that if you go to buy a box of 12 gauge shells from a retailer, then this is probably the amount you'd have in the box, unless you were buying in bulk or a special type of bullet. The standard amount of bullets you have in a box of 22 is either 50 or 100. The Suttons would most likely have the standard type of box you'd buy as they weren't exactly well off. So at the very least, if they went through four boxes of ammunition, assuming all four boxes were full, then on the low end, they shot four boxes of 12 or 20 gauge, about 100 shells that night. 400 if you want to assume all four boxes were 100 round boxes of 22, but it's most likely somewhere in between. But I'm just going to use the low end for my example. Lucky claimed that the creatures showed six different times that night. They also said that they didn't know if it was a large group or just two to three constantly reappearing because they were so fast. So if the maximum amount they shot was 100 divided by the six encounters, then that's about 16.6, repeating of course, shots per encounter. If all three guns were being shot, then that's them shooting 5.5 times per gun. Shooting five to six times isn't a lot in the grand scheme of things, but to review, all three of them would have to shoot five to six times at the creatures that would swiftly retreat after getting hit, and they were apparently fast enough to make them question the amount that they were actually dealing with. This just doesn't make sense. Picture it like this. Say it's just you alone shooting versus one of these creatures. The creatures appear and you shoot it five times before it disappears. This repeats two times. After the third time, you notice that your bullets do nothing to it. They're completely unaffected, and it'll retreat as long as you hit it once. How many times are you going to shoot it the fourth time? I think it's completely reasonable to say that they would put less shots down range. These would be unknown creatures, and one did grab at Billy Ray's hair, so there is definitely an argument to be made that they would put this many shots down range. However, all three of them would have to shoot this much at the same time, but no one has gotten hurt at this point, and the creatures retreat after getting shot one time. Not to mention that they were inside their house for most of these encounters, so it isn't like they would have free reign to unload shots. They would either have to take turns shooting through the window, or they would have to go outside to continue shooting. This seems to me that the claim of going through four boxes has to be a lie or an exaggeration that was taken by everyone to be serious. The issue this presents, however, is if JC was willing to exaggerate on how many boxes of ammunition they went through, then what else would he exaggerate on? Then, of course, we have the whole character of Billy Ray. He was reportedly already known in the family as someone who couldn't be taken seriously, and he changed his story multiple times when it came to the creatures doing interviews. Ledwith also seemed to pick up on the fact that Billy Ray enjoyed the attention he got. He also was reportedly the only person to get a monetary gain from the story when he sold his story to a reporter. But I don't think Billy Ray is behind this. If anything, he is at most an accomplice. I must admit, if this was a hoax, then I think there's only one person who could be behind it. Lucky Sutton. Lucky Sutton is described as a natural leader by Ledwith, a strong-willed man who seemed to be the one everyone in the family would listen to and respect, and he wasn't even the oldest sibling. When Ledwith asked about the nose of the creatures, Billy Ray spoke up about definitely seeing one, and Ledwith took note of Lucky's reaction. He noted that Lucky gave Billy Ray a disdainful look. If Lucky was smart enough to come up with a story, and for the most part be a convincing witness, then he would very easily see the flaw in Billy Ray's accounts. It's already known that Billy Ray wasn't the type of person you'd take seriously, so this could be Lucky realizing he shouldn't have trusted his friend to stay on track with their story. 
Lucky and Billy Ray did have a background with the traveling carnival, so some people speculated that they hatched a great idea to make their own attraction and try to get attention to it by coming up with this story. I mean, it wouldn't be too hard to shoot a couple holes in your window screen and say you shot aliens through it. This could be a very cut and dry case if this was all the evidence we had. If we stopped here, I would 100% agree it's a hoax orchestrated by Lucky and Billy Ray and put on with the rest of the family. But there's more to this than just this. Like I said before, they did in fact put up signs charging for admission and other things. Like I said before, they did in fact put up signs charging for admission and other things. It would seem like they were trying to make money off of it, but it wasn't the first thing they did. They initially tried keeping people away with police and no trespassing signs. Not to mention, Miss Linkford's plea to the public about leaving them alone. When this didn't work, that's when they put up the signs. If you're trying to fake a story like this or make a profit in any way, then you wouldn't do everything in your power to try and get people away from it before you try and profit off of it. It doesn't make any sense. So the real question is, what caused them to shoot? Maybe they initially tried to set up proof by shooting inside their house for their story and then backed out when they started getting attention, but why? Pandora's box was already open. There was no way they were going to get away from it now, so it wouldn't make sense for them to turn people away instead of profiting off of it if they wanted to make profit off of it in the first place. What's the point of them going through all the trouble of creating a hoax, making sure everyone sticks to the same story, then blowing it up all over the media only to not use the popularity you get from it? For that reason, it just doesn't add up or make sense to me that this is a hoax made for any form of profit. If it was purely made up by them just for the hell of it, then that would make more sense, but why? Why would you go through the trouble of creating this story just for fun? And you don't just sit around one day and you're like, I have the best idea. If you want to say that maybe they did it without realizing how big it got, then sure, but I don't know if I can say the story was completely made up by them. Assuming it was made up, 11 people had to keep their words and stories straight for years without one retracting their statements or ever admitting that it was made up through harassment and humiliation. I mean, J.C. Sutton literally had trouble keeping jobs over the story. They had every motive to stay away from the story as much as they could throughout the rest of their lives. They hated talking about it, turning down many interviews. That just doesn't sound like a story made up by a group for any sort of reason. And through all that, it just, I don't think it makes sense to say that this was a hoax in any form or way by the family. Then finally, there's the theory that it really was aliens, which would explain everything except the lack of evidence in the investigation. But there are some reports to support the claims of Billy Ray. A state trooper was about two to three miles away from the Sutton farmhouse around the time the police arrived to do their first investigation. He reported hearing a whining noise in the sky above him, and when he looked at his patrol car, he saw two meteors arcing in the sky coming from the direction of the Sutton farmhouse. When he reported the incident, he compared them to the whistling of artillery fire and said that they were definitely not any normal meteor he seen, and he had seen meteors. He watched the Perseids earlier that month, and these were larger and brighter than the ones he had just seen. And in case you never heard of the Perseids, don't worry, I hadn't either. They are a meteor shower that apparently happens from mid-July to late August, and I don't even know if I'm pronouncing the name right. I must also point out that when this officer was questioned again later, after the fact, he would retract his statements and said they were nothing more than meteors. I don't think this means that what he saw were normal meteors. Instead, I think it confirms that they weren't. I think it's completely reasonable to say that he changed his story to not attract the chaos the Suttons did. Many neighbors did the same after seeing what happened to them and turned down interviews, which, can you really blame them? There were thousands of people just trying to hear the story of the Suttons in one day. What would happen if that crowd set their sights on someone else? Now, I'm not saying that this 100% means that what he saw was in fact an alien spaceship. It could very well be that these meteors just so happened to fall nearby and what he heard was actually a meteor some people claim to have heard a buzzing or hissing noise with of seeing a meteor and they may be caused by a very low frequency radio wave and they are able to create sound waves as they tear through the atmosphere they can create a sonic boom but since they're so high up the sonic booms usually aren't heard around the same time you see the meteor instead arriving much later as sound travels much more slowly than the light off the meteor 
So who knows? And maybe the reason they looked so big was because they were close to the ground landing nearby. And that might be the case. They might be very weird meteors. But there's also another account. A neighbor interviewed by Ludwith, a man by the name of Mr. Ernest Long, said he had seen a light or fireball pass over his house around 6.30 p.m. towards the Suttons. Now, I know there's a big difference between a light and fireball, but it is still a report around the same time of Billy Ray's sighting, and I can't believe I'm going to say it, but maybe Billy Ray was telling the truth. Maybe he did see something in the sky that night, whether alien or meteor. But just because they saw something in the sky doesn't necessarily mean there were aliens running around the property, so let's look for more. We have the proof of gunfire actually coming from inside the house with the holes in the window screen and the BB shot in the window frame. There was something that made them feel like they had to shoot, and all we have is their testimonies to go by. It's not like they had phones to take a quick picture like we could today, but if it doesn't make sense to be a hoax, then what else can we believe? Was it aliens, mass hysteria, or was it those damned owls? I left what I feel is the most substantial proof for last, though. Miss Lankford. Those around her didn't take her for the type to create a massive story like this. She was a devout Christian, and... Russell Greenwell was even quoted talking about Miss Lankford saying, She was the most impressive witness. She's the type of person who wouldn't tell a lie if her life depended on it. Two of her sons, who weren't present at the farm that night, even said later that when they first heard about the story, they didn't believe it. They thought it was just a joke by someone at the farmhouse. But when they heard their mother was claiming the same story, they immediately changed their views. Tillman Sutton was quoted as saying, If Mama saw it, it was there. Even later, when Isabel Davis would interview her herself for the book, she got the same impression. Miss Lankford was a God-fearing Christian by everyone who met her. Many people said her word alone was enough proof to show that they really did see something. It's hard to believe that this woman would have everyone around her fooled to the point that she would be able to fake this story with seemingly no reason for the story to exist in the first place. She would have to be a Batman-level mastermind to have her reputation like that just to use it for an alien conspiracy. And again, let me remind you, through nothing but harassment and humiliation by most who heard the story. So, what do you believe? Was it aliens, or was it something else? I'm not really sure entirely, but the fact that the story became as big as it did, it went on to go on to inspire many works that we know and love today. Steven Spielberg is noted as taking interest in the story, using it as inspiration for some of his movies like Close Encounters with the Third Kind, Gremlins, and even E.T. The creatures even inspired the design of a Pokemon, Sableye. It was designed after the description of the creatures, and just so you know, Sableye is a cave-dwelling Pokemon, so all I'm going to say is maybe there is some merit to the Hollow Earth theories, and maybe Nintendo is secretly hinting us towards it. The city of Hopkinsville holds a Little Green Men Festival every year on August 21st, celebrating the anniversary of the event and the supernatural in general. They even have an exhibit in their local museum dedicated to the sighting. I went to it, and it was actually an interesting museum. There's a lot of history in the town of Hopkinsville, and if you live nearby, I definitely recommend it. I did also drive out to where the Sutton Farmhouse originally was, but it's long gone now. There's a playground that stands there today, and unfortunately I didn't see any signs of aliens. I wish I did though, that would have been great content. Anyways, I don't know which theory that I believe the most in, all of them had their flaws and I doubt we'll ever find out the truth of what happened that night, but it's still a fun story to look into nonetheless. Looking at these stories of cryptids is a lot of fun, and I'm glad I could share it with you. And if I did have to pick just one theory to believe in, then I'm sticking with the rocket monkey theory. I don't care how wrong it is. I wanted to make this video because I seen Wendigoon's cryptid tier list video, and I noticed that there were some details wrong with his description on the case. This made me realize that people may not fully know the true story of the Hopkinsville Goblin case, and I didn't even fully know the case when I first started. Thanks to the papers at the time over-dramatizing the event, and instead of actually documenting it like reporters should, it's very hard to find factual info on it. I don't blame Wendigoon for getting any details wrong, as he has like 300 plus cryptids to research, and like 95% of the articles are one to two paragraphs basically saying things happened, and half of them contradict each other on basic details, much like the papers from 70 years ago. That's why Ludwig's accounts is so useful. Not only does it cut the bullshit of the media, it's actually a good record of the account. Anyways, 
sorry for the rant if you enjoyed this video then let me know i'll try to make more because these are pretty fun to make when i'm not up at 3 a.m imagining incomprehensible horrors awaiting me in the darkness <clears throat> i mean my pet cats thank you guys for watching